We are back. Usually I would say welcome to another edition of Kevin's Corner, but if I'm not mistaken, and lo and behold, technology better behave with us, uh, I believe uh, this is the first uh, edition of our rebrand. Again, nothing from a you need to subscribe to a different podcast, anything like that, but you will see in your podcast feed a new graphic and a new title for us here. The powers that be told us uh, this will help from an SEO standpoint, so Colts Corner with Kevin Bowen. Eddie Garrison, how do you like that? Sounds good. Sounds good. I think it looks good. I'm looking at the graphic right now. A little blue graphic here on the football field. Got a nice hash uh, marks going in yard signs. Yeah, That's nice. Yeah, a little horseshoe action there. So Shout out to Nick Cotton, Jim. He's been on it lately. Thank you to Nick here on our digital team. He does outstanding work. Um, yeah, this is cool. So, um, again, I don't think it's going to cause you to do anything differently. Although, you know what? If you haven't given us a rating and a review in a while and you're feeling in a good mood on that, we wouldn't be disappointed on that end. Good so, 4th of July weekend? Good 4th of July, yeah. Uh, and this is a holiday that uh, I choose to take part in significantly from a let's get some time away and the NFL world, I think, uh, this is the one because Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's <laughs> looks a little different once you kind of get into that part of the calendar. Hell, even Labor Day um, can look a bit different on that end. So, yeah, enjoy the time with the family, relaxing, and um now, now we're back at it, Eddie. I mean, it is, what, two weeks from tomorrow, right? It's yeah. Court day, and uh, this podcast will be one of our favorites we do each year. It's the indispensable Colts. I think it can lead to some great chatter, great debate, and looking forward to that. So that'll be the focus here. Next week we'll get into really position battles and you know guys with the most approved maybe on the roster, and then – after that, it's we'll hear from Chris Bauer the first day of training camp. We'll recap that, and we'll get into the swing of things from a Grand Park standpoint. So, again, indispensable Colts. When you think of that, Eddie, I think it's important that we define it. Guys you can't afford to lose. Mm-hmm. Guys that you would feel the loss of the most. Um, this not only involves the individual player, but it involves what the depth chart looks like around said player. So I think those are two important things to keep in mind. This is not a, a best player cult list. It's not a player of guys with the most upside. It is a who can you not who do you not want to see inactive? Who do you not want to see go on injured reserve? And what would that look like? So plenty of debate to be had. Uh, we'll do a five through one countdown, if you will, and then certainly hit on some guys that just missed the list and Uh, Unless I'm missing anything, Eddie, let's lead it off. As you noted there, we will get to your honorable mention. So we will start with the fifth most indispensable cult on your list and work our way up to the most indispensable with cornerback Kenny Moore the second. Kenny Moore is a man that has appeared on this list before. Um, I think when I view his role with this team, it's the versatility at corner. It's the fact that he can play slot, of course, at a very high level, but also lines up outside in that base defense. I think it's important to remember about Kenny, too, and obviously you saw it in the Carolina win last year. The guy is not just a solid corner. He gets his hands on balls. He like He's a disruptive player, whether it is pass deflections, interceptions. Um, it still amazes me teams continue to run swing screen passes in his direction. <laughs> he seemingly, I feel like he makes a play on the first possession of every game. Yeah. That is just a big third down stop, get you off the field, negative play, short gain, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a few more options at corner. I don't want to like discredit it. I think I've said this throughout our offseason pods, Eddie. I feel better about corner options than I do safety options. Uh huh. But still, um, when you consider his versatility, his leadership. When you consider his leadership, that's a good point. Um, yeah, his veteran makeup and his ability to play make and not just be a corner, I think all of that really, really um, checks out. So um, I got Kenny Moore, number five on the list. Plus, he's been pretty available and durable. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, uh, yes. I would say he had the one year where he was out, what, that end of December, right? And you yeah. felt his loss. But yeah, I would say for the most part, he's been a very durable and really a guy that you just don't. You don't take off the field. It's base outside and it's nickel inside, and there's not many corners in this league that have that responsi- responsibility on their plate. Speaking of a player that is always on the field, never takes himself out of a game, never misses a game, and comes in at number four on your list of most indispensable Colts, that would be the all-pro defensive lineman DeForest Buckner. You know, go back to what I said to start off 
the show, Eddie, you've got to be a good player, and you also have to oftentimes fall on this list, be at a position where there's not a lot of depth. That's not true here. You have some depth along the defensive line. I mean, you could get by, I think, to a degree with, you know, hell, you know, Dio Dengbo and Tyquan Lewis can slide inside. So um, you've got some dudes, but Buckner's just rare. He's just, he, he's three down rare. I mean, you, you talk durable. I mean, he defines durability. He defines production at defensive tackle. It's a really hard combo to have durability and production and three down production. Uh-huh. I think that's the other thing you have to emphasize with it is when they go to that IndyCar package on third downs, it's not Buckner coming off the field. You know, Grover Stewart oftentimes comes off the field, but Buckner stays on there and can rush from a variety of spots. I mean, you see Buckner sometimes opposite a ta- tackle um, and trying to get, you know, that sort of matchup on him. So, um, again, a common theme on this list, Eddie, is a lack of depth to a degree at certain spots. I think yeah. we'll especially see that as we rise higher up on the list. But here, it's not necessarily that. It's just that Buckner for a defensive tackle is rare, is unique. I mean, you could, you could. Pr- you can make the case he, especially with Aaron Donald hanging it up, he might be the most unique defensive tackle in the league. I don't know if he's the best. I'm sure you could debate that. But again, three downs, durable, productive. It's hard to check that box. Yeah, I think Both the only guys. other guy you're probably putting over DeForest Buckner, at least unquestionably, would be Chris Jones from Kansas yeah. City. And again, they're probably better. They're you know they're more you know a guy that you know whatever a double digit sack guy, a dozen sack guy. Y- okay, I can get that. But the three downs and like lit. I mean, how many games did he miss the Colt? Oh, that's a good question. I c- I can't even tell you. Felt like he's always out there. What like two maybe? I and like I feel like at times when like a Colt misses a game that's super durable. I feel like, oh yeah, they were a close contact for COVID back in that one season. Oh yeah. I mean, like, I mean, that's honestly, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. I, I, I literally think that's the only game he's missed. 17, 17, 17, each of the last three seasons. Just stupid. I mean, percentages of defensive snaps well north of 70. Again, numbers you just don't see. He's a, he, he is a rare breed. Now, is that why you put him over uh, Grover Stewart? Because we saw how valuable Grover Stewart was yeah, it, last season. It, it's just the three down. You know, we haven't f- seen Buckner miss a month and a half. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? Right. Like, yes, you know, Grover. You know, Grover fell into a category, and we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Some of the guys that I thought about, but um, you know, I think if the Raquan Davis presence probably was a reason why I just didn't go maybe all in on that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, DeForest Buckner number four. All right, you've mentioned this player a time or two um, in previous podcasts when we were referencing this one in terms of when we list out our five most indispensable Colts for the upcoming season. I'm surprised he checks in at number three, that being safety Julian Blackman. I hear you out there. I just I, I don't sleep well at night thinking about the safeties. I didn't sleep well the Saturday night before the Houston game. Or hell, the Friday night before the Houston game. Certainly didn't sleep well the Saturday night after the Houston game. And nine months later, I don't know if I'm sleeping much better. It, it just There's just a lack. No position lacks more clear depth yeah. than safety. And again, think about versatility with Blackman. I mean, he, he, he's played a lot of spots. Oh, yeah. You know, and had a career year last year. Had a position switch of strong safety. So, you know, I've I've been a big Blackman guy throughout my, whatever, throughout his career, I should say. And, like, I like him as a player. Is he a top five player in this football team? No. I don't want to act like that. But when you consider depth, more than any other player on this list, yeah. when you consider the lack of depth, to me, he's got to fall on that list. And, again, it's the versatility. It's the communication. It's it's the playmaking at multiple levels. I think he's done that in his career. Um, all of that. Julian Blackman really, really checks out. So, you know, I have a feeling if, whatever, my colleagues did a similar list like this, they probably wouldn't have Blackman as high as I do. Mm. But I do have him that high. And I think you have to acknowledge, too, Eddie, like the quarterback schedule is just better. And it's better earlier in the year. So it's one of those things where it's like, hey, Nick Cross in November could look different than Nick Cross in September. Well, okay, the problem is, is it's Stroud and it's, Love and it's Tua and it's Josh Allen and Goss. it's Rogers. Goss. You know, a lot of these guys you're you, you play front loaded on your schedule there. So um, I think I can make a strong case for Julian Blackman at number three, and 
clearly I feel good about it to throw them on here. After we go through your five and all of our mentions, I'll give you my five, so it'll be fascinating to see what you think of my five. I like it. All right, Kevin, so just to recap so far, number five on your list, Kenny Moore the second, number four, DeForest Buckner, this wraps up number three, Julian Blackman. So our final two are second most undispensable cult, according to you, wide receiver Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah, you know, not as high as maybe he was, or I, I – I think at one point I might have had him number one, to be honest with you. I mean, certainly that Atlanta game last year just sticks out so much of how much you missed him in that contest. Um, I do think the depth with A.D. Mitchell makes me sleep a little better at night, and I am probably a little bit more of a don't shut the door or certainly don't slam the door on Alec Pierce like some people are. Um, We can probably get more into that during Twitter questions. But, you know, Pittman, you just – you can't discredit his reliability, his toughness, and his durability. And that stuff is vital for a young rookie quarterback. And you don't have that at wide out. And I don't think you have that really at tight end either. So that's where I think part of that kind of plays into it of, you know, if you look on this list, a couple of these guys have direct impacts to Anthony Richardson. And that's why I do think Pittman still deserves to be that high, even though I do think, again, A.D. Mitchell can come in and make an impact. It's a lot to ask for a rookie, though, to do that, you know, consistently in his first NFL season. So, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about slotting Pittman in here at number two. All right, drum roll, please. Number one, the most undispensable Colt, according to you, Bernard Ryman. Bernie. I'm going Bernie. Who's your backup left tackle? Blake Freeland, right? You would assume? Yeah, yeah. Assume uh, how many snaps did Blake Freeland play at left tackle last season? Ooh, I don't know. Do you? Uh, did Ryman miss a game? <clears throat> oh yeah, I thought he did. I thought there was so a. So was it just one for Freeland out there? I thought it was. Basically, what I'm getting at is, in no way did Blake Freeland play the amount of snaps at left tackle that he played at right tackle. Right. And you know, right's again where he drilled a little bit more. I think you know where you felt a little bit more comfortable about him. Um, I guess if you, if you even want to say that, I mean, I get that you know you know he's put on this weight and um, you know the hope is he can hold up a little bit better. But still, um, Ryman missed two games, Rams and Titans. Yep. Yeah. So I, I just I don't have great you know. Does Matt Gonzalez walk in here and all of a sudden become the backup left tackle when you know again he? didn't really play much at all last season so I think when you factor all of that in and then to me the domino effect of if he is not out there I mean you saw what happened in those two games you know Rams and 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 Titans it's just the trickle down effect of that can be right at Anthony Richardson Um, you know interior wise you've got options but you just don't have it to that degree at left tackle so um, I have often put Anthony Costanzo very, very high on this list. I think Ryman is a quality player, but I think the drop-off is significant and notable, and the drop-off could also lead to injury, could lead to you know Anthony Richardson, and that's why I feel like he deserves to be number one on this list. So, yeah, Ryman one, Pittman two, Blackman three, Buckner four, Kenny Moore five. Your disagreements, Eddie Garrison? Um, I have no disagreements. I mean... All those players, besides Buckner, made my five. He was an honorable mention for me. Uh, so my five were at number five was Bernie. I put Jonathan Taylor at number four. Kenny Moore at three. Julian Blackman, number two. And then Michael Pittman Jr., top of the list. Yeah, you know, I guess other names I thought of. I certainly thought of Taylor. I thought about Zaire Franklin. Um, I thought about Anthony Richardson. I thought about Braden Smith. You know, mentioned Grover a little bit. Um for Richardson, the thing that held me back from putting him top five was the drop off to the next guy. Like, if you told me right now, extrapolate Joe Flacco's season out for 16 games, 17 uh-huh. games. Yeah. And if you said Anthony Richardson played like that this season, you'd sign up for it. Uh huh. So, like, the offense might look different, but Flacco was what? A, a top, what do you call him? Top 15 quarterback last year? Top 20 quarter? I, I, I don't know how, how you would define it, but that drop off is not as significant. So, and Richardson, I guess, is yet to prove it. And I, and I think there's an element of that that belongs in this list. Uh, again, typically quarterbacks do fall on this list. But I just don't feel it in that same sort of light. Um, 
Taylor, you know, I've thought about it with no Moss, but I just, I, I tend to think Eddie backup running back is just such an expe- expendable position. You know, I mean, the Browns lose Nick Chubb in what week two, and you know they're still able to, you know, make do and you know, mm-hmm. tons of injuries, and still able to make the playoffs. And you know, Franklin, again, interior linebacker. I don't think of that as super high on the list, but I do think linebacker depth is very much up in the air. You know, I I, I like the duo Franklin and Speed, but what's behind them? I think that's a real question that you would have there as well. So those are some others I thought about. Again, Brayden Smith over right tackle. You know, he's got to stay healthier. Um, that, of course, plays into it. But, you know, Freeland at least played over there a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, it's always a fun debate. I think you can hear a lot on some other names on that list. But uh, for the most part, I felt pretty good about the five that I went with. If the other teams across the NFL did this same exercise – how many teams would not have their quarterback as a top five? Right. I mean, it's certainly a hat tip to Flacco. And it's also an acknowledgement of Richardson has, what, started and finished one game in his career. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, you know, both of those are kind of the double whammies. But, yeah, I mean, most teams, I, yeah, I, I don't know my list of backup quarterbacks because seemingly they change every year around the league. You know, obviously, like, the Raiders would not put Minshew or McConnell or excuse McConnell, me, wow. I'm thinking TJ McConnell. Uh, I think he can play quarterback. You know, are not, there's not a big difference between Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. So, like, they're obviously not going to put it on this list. But, you know, most teams, obviously Kansas City's of the world and Buffalo's of the world and, you know, the Ravens of the world. I mean, those teams are going to put those guys on that list. And it could change in a hurry. I mean, Flacco could fall off a cliff. Uh-huh. Uh, and obviously, age-wise, if you're projecting out, and Richardson could look great, and Richardson's going to be number one for years to come. Um so, you know, I, I think there's probably people out there that would put Richardson on the list and put Richardson somewhat high on the list. Yeah. But I just don't think the one to two drop off at that position is as significant as others. Obviously, quarterback means a ton, but still, I mean, again, if you just went off raw data, you would say Flacco was a better quarterback than Richardson last year. Uh huh. So, you know, for that reason, you would not do that. I put Taylor on my list because A, they're paying him to be. The bell cow that he was just a handful of seasons ago and right. be that and be one of the top running backs in the league. And if the expectation is there's they're going to run the football a lot between him and Richardson to set up the pass and teams are going to defend the run first compared to the pass, then I feel like Taylor's very, very indispensable considering the talent behind him is unproven still. I um, can- I can I can definitely hear you out there. And yeah. like if there's no Jonathan Taylor, then what scares you besides Michael Pittman Jr.? Like that's the reality that I think the Colts are in right now, and that I think that's how defensive coordinators view them as well. That's a good argument. Yeah, I could um I could I could certainly see where you're where you're coming from in that. Again, I tend to think with Richardson's presence with the offensive line, it's still a rather interchangeable I mean, Zach Moss put up numbers last year, he never sniffed the Buffalo. Right. So, you know, that's where I kind of lean towards not having Taylor as high. But, again, to the point you just made, Eddie, how many teams wouldn't have quarterback on this list? How many teams would have running back even as high as sixth? I would seventh? say San Francisco for sure. Yeah, but not not many. <laughs> oh, I mean, there I are not many out there. I was just trying to think of one that, you know, a couple off the top of my head, and right. San Francisco is obviously number one. So, um, yeah, I think that is something to point out as well. Unless you have uh, anything else to add, you ready for the few Twitter questions that we have? Let's do them. Only three to get to this week on Twix. Neil is up first. Are you surprised that the Indianapolis Colts first round pick was a defensive player because Shane Steichen is an offensive minded head coach or was it just best player off the board type of pick? Well, I think I think it's an interesting point that Neil brings up. You know, if you look at the past two drafts of Shane Steichen, you will see heavy offense, you know, in the first, you know, three to four to five picks of each of those two drafts. Um but I also think you got to keep in mind how Chris Bauer views it. I mean, he he might consider pass rush the most important thing on the whole roster. He might. I mean, you know, he made a pursuit for Daniel, Daniel Hunter yeah. this offseason. And, Justin Jefferson. You know, I think a little bit more of the debate would have been Bowers at 15 versus, you know, having Latu there. But again, I just think the position, I mean, they had Latu as a top five prospect. Yep. And I think so much of that is rooted in the position that he plays. And, you know, the thing about Latu, too, is he's different than Dallas Turner. Like, there's not a whole lot of 
major projection. You feel like, outside of the neck, which I know is a big one, you feel like it's pretty safe with how you're viewing Latu in terms of productive at UCLA, lined up on both sides, variety of moves, works his bleeping ass off, all those things. Um, but yeah, I I I do think Bowers would have been interesting had he fallen a couple more. But again, I mean, tight end just it ain't it ain't edge rusher. We always talk about in the first round you try to take players at premier positions that just because that's where the talent is the most rich. And I just felt like I felt like it was going to be Dallas Turner because I thought he they would be more enamored with the traits aspect like Ballard typically what right. is and was, right. but. I'm glad he, you know, changed his mind up a little bit and went with Latu because he has the production and Turner didn't have quite the production as Latu did. And I think it's something we talked about that Friday podcast after the Thursday night of the draft, Eddie, of like a little bit of the growing Ballard draft philosophy of, yes, I love the traits, love them. Let's marry a little bit more production with it. And maybe perhaps they're wanting more production instantly versus trying to wait on another developmental player with all these traits. Sure. Because they're in the window that they're in, or they believe they're in the window right now to make a playoff push with Anthony Richardson, and um, I feel like that's potentially why they went with lots of overturners. as Certainly. well. I think it's a good point. Second Twitter question comes from Austin. What do you think so far of Caitlin Clark's season? Ooh. About what you expected? Better? Worse? Also, do you plan on going to any games? Uh, Caitlin Clark banging the anvil. Colts, Texans. Ooh. Week one. You want to you uh, give me a fever schedule. When is week one? Uh, September, is it 10th? That sound right? 9th? Yeah, it's somewhere around uh, 9-11. That's all I remember. 8th. 8th. Okay, let me pull up the fever schedule. Um, You know, as far as Clark, yeah, well, I guess, yes, I, I've, I've been to two. Uh, I'm going to my third one here coming up tomorrow. We're recording Ooh. this Tuesday morning. Are they on the road? They play. On, on that Sunday? At 4 o'clock. <laughs> at home? Yes. Oh man, jeez! How about that double dip there? For a week, only guy oh, can't you come over at twelve thirty, at twelve forty-five, bang the anvil, and be back in time for shoot around? Well, I'm sure shoot arounds already happened before that. That's probably treatment and game film and whatever. Um, yeah, I've been to been fortunate to go to a couple games. Going to take Rosie. Um, We've been to a couple together. Yes, sat across from you at the Kennedy Carter Chicago Sky. Indiana that was fun Fever game. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's just so much on Clark's plate. It, it's you know, she's the rookie quarterback with just everything on the plate, and you're asking her to do so much. Um, obviously, her turnover number has come down. You know, to me, she had the triple double on Saturday that yep. stands out like none other. She also had four turnovers in the game, which is the smallest she's had in a month. Fewest, so, uh, fewest. Yeah, she she's had in a month. So I just. You just see growth and all of it. And I mean, more than any of that, Austin, I'm just so damn impressed by how she carries herself. It's just, I mean, like picturing me at 22 and seeing the scrutiny and the constant criticism that is all over me. Um, If I were her at that age, I mean, I'd, I'd, I would wilt. I would cry. And not even just like the scrutiny and that stuff, the things that where she's been in the headlines and it's not even been her, her re- sure, fault. Sure. The Kennedy Carter situation. <laughs> Um, and of course, there's the other situation with Greg Doyle that happened immediately to start the season for her with the Indiana Fever. And then uh, you've got Angel, the whole Angel Reese thing. You've got all sorts of stuff. And I think she's been way better than advertised just as a professional. Yeah, I, I think something, too, that I've always like, you know, I've always been a LeBron guy more than most. I think what has always just wildly impressed me about LeBron, Tiger falls into this category. Caitlin Clark certainly falls into this category. I had to throw a tiger You're in there. Teenage years, and you have the weight of the world on you. Yeah. And in some of these cases, they've had race on their shoulders. They've had sex on their shoulders. I mean, like all of that, like having the weight of the world and carrying a female demographic, a a a, a, a black race for tiger in, in that sport. Like at that age, I mean, imagine where you were at at 19, 20, uh-huh. 21. Like that to me, and you know, unlike Tiger and LeBron. Everything for Clark has been in the social media age. Uh-huh. You know that to me just adds to it more. So yes, wildly impressed with how she's handled it, and I think on court now you're starting to really see like, yes, she is undoubtedly one of the best players in that league, and um, she's fun to watch. Man, her vision is incredible. 
Her her ability to pass is absurd. I, I think that's her best attribute. I mean, certainly shooting threes uh, to the level that she can and the distance she can is very impressive, but her vision is otherworldly. I think her awareness is also... Yeah, both of something that doesn't get. Boat. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, her she sees three passes ahead, and yeah, she catches her teammates off guard a ton. So yeah, she is. Um, she's a special, special talent. Final Twitter question is from Joe. He says, "Let's be honest. I love Alec Pierce, but he doesn't stand a chance against Adonai Mitchell. The real question is, when, not if, does AD press Michael Pittman Jr. for the number one spot? Since it seems." that it's not fully locked down. Can that happen? And what do you need to see from him this year to start trending that way? Thank you for what you do. Much love. I appreciate that, Joe. Thank you for the question. You know, Andy Sweeney and I are morning show hosts, co-hosts with me here on The Fan. We do a Colts question of the day, and our question the other day was, go back to that 2022 draft. Those first four picks, Pierce, uh, Woods, Ryman, and Cross. Ryman, unquestionable hit. Outstanding draft pick. Yes, sir. Uh, the other three, you enter year three very much up in the air on all three of them. From a Pierce, from a Cross, and a Woods standpoint. But again, all three of them in, in different ways. If you break down all three of them, Eddie, you know, Pierce, it's been more of, you know, he's gotten the opportunity. How much is circumstance? Uh, maybe because we're in Indy, we'll make an Indy car analogy, but is Pierce the talented driver on a bad team? And he goes to Team Penske or Team Ganassi, and all of a sudden his talent shines. Do you view that in that light? Do you view Gardner Minshew and Matt Ryan having held him back? And now all of a sudden you put Anthony Richardson in, and now you accentuate yeah. Pierce's strengths. Is that a question that's on the table? For Cross, he's had the opportunity. He's been benched on multiple occasions. Right. And how much of that do you attribute to age? Because again, he was the young draft pick, and the Colts thought, "Oh, he'll be a second rounder next year. Let's, you know, trade if you would have come back to Maryland. Let's trade up and make the selection there." And then Woods, of course, it's injury. He he did flash as a rookie. So I think a great question is like, who are you most confident in, that, in out of those three to emerge in year three? It's is a very it Cross? Good question. Is it Pierce? Is it Woods? Most would probably say Woods, I would think. But again, he plays a position group that. It's a lot of interchanging and, you know, consistent roles for any tight end. I'd be hard pressed to find here this season. Um, I tend to think that Pierce has been held back to some degree from the quarterback play. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I think he still has like six plays, I want to say over 30 yards in his career. That's that's notable. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's played a lot, but still, that is notable as well. So, um, I, I, Again, I think A.D. Mitchell is coming, I guess, to answer the question or to agree with that. But again, like I've said before with Pierce, I don't think that just means that Pierce is flat out benched. I think he still can be a lull you to sleep, Richardson has the big arm, let's tap into this a little bit more sort of potential there. Kind of like the Joe's question here. Um, Can you see Adonai developing, or does he have the traits? I should say, first of all, to become a, like a top tier wide receiver on a team, can he be the number one guy? Yeah, I, 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 th- I could listen to that conversation, and, and I couldn't listen to it on Pierce. Again, I still think Pierce can give you something, but I don't think Pierce has that skill set. Mitchell, to me, has more of that. And you know, I actually watched Pierce a decent amount at Cincinnati. You know, right, they, they faced Notre Dame, they faced IU. They obviously had a really good team this final season, making the playoff. I probably watched probably a handful of Cincinnati games. This Pierce we've seen so far in the NFL is pretty much what we saw at Cincinnati. Yeah. Now Ritter threw him the ball a little bit more, and he had some more big plays. And trust me, he beat you know corners one on one a whole lot in college. And when he's had moments in the NFL, he's flashed a little bit there. But you know, you need the right quarterback, and also you know corners are just better at this level, mm-hmm. and they're going to win more. And they have one more, and just kind of blanket him overall. That's why he's gained the weight, and he's tried to you know improve his play strength and things like that. So, um, those three, a big storyline I think for this season. Who of that twenty twenty two trio of draft picks emerge? Um, going to be really important for at least one of them. I know we'll get into this a little bit later as you know training camp starts and the season approaches, but um, from an expectation level from Adonai Mitchell, when you look at some of the rookie records. Bill Brooks has held the yards record for a rookie since 1986, 1,131. T.Y. Hilton, the second in 2012, 861. 
and then Marvin Harrison in 1996 with 836. In terms of receptions, Josh Downs set that last year, uh, 68, and then touchdowns, Bill Brooks and Marvin Harrison Jr. each tied with eight. Um, John Mackey and Austin Colley and T.Y. Hilton are tied for third with seven. So when you look at those three statistical categories, are there in any of those three, could you see Adonai Mitchell popping up in the what, top three? What was yards again? Eight something you said? 836. That was third. A- 836 is yards? Yes. Yeah, I mean, probably not. I mean, those are all pretty big numbers, but like, I, I still, th- I mean, it would take, I think, a big Pittman injury for that to happen, but I still think he can be very important. You know, again, downs outside of receptions, not like he had tons of yards or touchdowns, but still was really, really key uh-huh. for you. And I think downs is kind of a forgotten guy a bit in the wideout room, too, when we discuss the makeup of that group. Hell, I probably should have mentioned him a little bit earlier there when discussing Pierce. So, um, I still view Mitchell as having an opportunity, certainly, to be a very key guy early on. And, you know, if you look at his Texas career, Eddie, it wasn't consistency. And, you know, for those categories, you need consistency. You know, to be a catch guy, to be a yard guy. You know, at, at Texas, it was more of the flash. I think he only had three games in his career over 80 yards. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would think that is one of the questions that he must answer. But, you know, even if he doesn't answer it as a rookie, I still think if he shows some flash, uh, he can. Uh, he can. He has the traits. Now it's about putting it all together. And a couple house cleaning items here. Um, next week, July the 18th, Thursday is our back nine fan golf outing. You can come see Kevin Bowen, Jake Query will be there, Andy Sweeney, your co host. Come on out if you're in the Indy area. Oh, we, yeah. We absolutely love it. So it's a great time to interact with listeners. And uh, like you said, great view of downtown and cool event, fun, laid back. Uh, we interact with everybody. You know, everybody's in their own bays on the same floor. So it's a cool, cool time. Jack Daniels will be the sponsor. So Can't there'll be a that. lot of good drinks. Um, Cannot beat that. If you're interested and you haven't purchased your tickets yet, 1075thefan.com. And while you're there, while uh, you can. Interact with the fan a month later as well. We got a little pickleball action, don't That's we? That's right. Yeah. Are, are you a pickleballer? Are, are, I am not like a, a massive one. I probably dabble. I don't know. Once every four months, something like that. I don't know. Three months. You and Maddie, or is it just you? Yeah, Maddie and I uh, try to play. So, nice. Uh, yeah, it is fun, and that will be up. Uh, and remind me the date on that. It's sometime in August, isn't it? I believe it's the twenty fourth. I could be off by a day or two there. Get our website. We'll have details on that. But yeah, um, we'll be out. There. I think a lot of personalities at uh, our respective stations here within Radio 1 will be up, uh, I believe, Lebanon area for that. So look forward right. to that as well. It'll be uh, right at the tail end of training camp there. Uh, and a reminder, too, Colts Corner with Kevin Bowen. Again, that is the new rebranded Kevin's Corner. So appreciate you guys uh, putting some eye candy on that. Again, if you don't mind, leave us a review, leave us a rating. We would greatly appreciate that. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Look at that. Like and subscribe. Let's just cover it all right here. He's Eddie Garrison. I'm Kevin Bowen. Everybody have a great week. Great weekend. We'll talk to you next week.